Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and in this video I'm going to look at the Blackmagic Design ATEM Studio Converter 2, technically. Because on the side it says Studio Converter 2, even though online they don't make any mention of the number 2 in the description of this product. But anyway, I got this very inexpensively from an auction that found it in a storage unit. So it was like, found thing, not, uh, not guaranteed to be working, but assumed to be working. So uh, it was for parts of repair, but theoretically could have worked. And uh, when I got it and first plugged it in, it did not in fact work. But let me back up. The reason I wanted one of these is because, well, I don't really need one, um, but I like fiber optics and I think they're cool. So I thought it'd be cool to run my Blackmagic studio cameras using fiber optic links, even though the run is extremely short, being maybe about 25 feet of cable right now. And of course, right now it's using a standard coax SDI link. But hey, I mean, I could use the excuse as a lot of electromagnetic interference in my basement uh, due to all the equipment around here. And so theoretically, a fiber optic link, well, not theoretically, a fiber optic link would not be susceptible to that interference. And so that theoretical interference um, would be ameliorated with the use of fiber optics. In all honesty, I was using coax for years and it's been fine for 4K video. So I had no real reason to buy this, like I said, other than, well, it's cool. So let's take a look at it real quick. So here's the front of it. It has got jacks for headsets. So there's a XLR jack for headset or um, a quarter inch and a that many inches jack for the microphone on the headset. It has talk back buttons, so you can talk to each of your different cameras, up to four cameras. And well, each of these devices supports four cameras, which we'll get to around the back, and a volume control and a speaker on the front for a talk back. Now that does not monitor on camera audio, nor, my, nor does this have anything to do with on camera audio, as in like the audio feed from a microphone to the camera, but it's about the audio feed from a camera operator's headset to the camera and then to this device. Around the back, we have some connectors, probably what you'd expect, or maybe not. Uh, of course, as expected, there is a line voltage power connector. There's also a 12 volt backup power connector and a USB 2.0 jack. Now that's really just for firmware upgrade. There's a Blackmagic Studio Converter application, which is used for updating firmware and in other Blackmagic applications of that sort, they can be used to control the device itself, you know, change settings and so forth. But this has no settings. It's only used for firmware as far as I can tell. There are RCA jacks for audio monitoring. And then we have a, re a repeat of four identical interface areas, which includes optical in and out going to each camera, an SDI out, which is that camera's video feed, which is basically just a conversion from the optical to the SDI coax output, and analog audio out, which is obviously two male XLR jacks. And that is actually the on-camera audio. Like if you had a microphone hooked up to the audio in jack on the camera, that would come out on one of these, or both if you had two microphones, or a stereo microphone in any case. And then all the way on this side, we have some additional connections. We have the program video with an in and out, which is basically a loop through. And the program in here gets output to each of these optical outputs going back to each camera. So you can feed the program back to each camera as you would usually do with a separate SDI coax cable. We have microphone in and out and headphone in and out. Now that's not for, again, the on-camera audio. That's for the camera operator's audio through their headset and the mic and the headphone uh, respectively. And this is so that you can loop that audio data through to multiple of these units or output it somewhere else and use it for whatever you want. It's AES EBU um, audio and multi-channel as far as I understand, one channel for each camera, which would correspond to the buttons on the front. And on the top, you have press to talk. On the bottom, you have lock to talk for each of the four cameras. And of course, a volume control and mute button. And I'm sorry for any lack of clarity on the operation of the headsets. Um, I'm not really here to talk about the talkback functionality because, well, I don't have camera operators. Um, it's just me and all my cameras are fixed. I mostly bought this for its fiber to coax conversion. But for those of you that are curious, uh, this is an old model, but Blackmagic Design still does sell it. Uh, it's still a current product and it retails for 2000 bucks. I got it for 
considerably less than that, less than, well, considerably less than half of that. Um, and they will convert it to fiber optic link up to 28 miles away, bi-directional video plus tally and talk back. And here are some input and output specifications for those of you that are curious. You can pause it here. I'll just save you the trouble of going to look it up on Blackmagic Design's website. And Blackmagic Design does have a newer product, which they call the ATM Talkback Converter 4K, which makes it sound like this one is not capable of 4K video. And in fact, that might have been an issue with mine. You can see here it says one times 10 bit SDHD switchable program input. It doesn't mention 4K or UHD here anywhere. However, if you go down to the standard section, it does actually list Ultra HD specification formats. And uh, I happen to shoot in 2160p24, but it will support everything up to 30 frames per second. It will not support 60 frames per second because it's 6G max and not 12G. I think this one, I believe, is 12G and does, in fact, support 2160p60. Now, otherwise, there are very similar products. The list supports eight cameras at once. You only have to buy one of these devices rather than two of the other one. And obviously, it's 60 frames per second. It's a bit better. Uh, with 12G SDI. And this one retails only for 500 bucks more. So if you have eight cameras to run, I suppose I would recommend getting this, but they have basically the same functionality. So with four cameras, you can probably get one of these on the used market for about half that. And so like I said, I got lucky buying this four parts not working, which, you know, it was possibly working at uh, significantly less than that. But when I took it home, plugged it in to test it out, it didn't work. Um, no video, no nothing. Although I don't have uh, compatible headsets to check the headset functionality, but the front panel did light up. And just for the sake of argument, there is the illuminated front panel and the buttons did work initially when I got it. So that was great. But like I said, no video whatsoever. And one reason I did target this one is because it came with SFPs, which not all of them do. So if you're not familiar, these things often sell without SFPs. So you just get blank holes in the back. And the SFPs are the basically the interface from the copper connections inside the unit to the fiber optic connections. So these are what have the laser emitters and laser detectors in them. And you'll notice that this says Blackmagic Design 6G transceiver. So obviously the, well, newer model, the 12G model would come with a different transceiver or you would have to buy different transceivers for it. And this operates at 1310 nanometers, which is fairly deep into infrared. But you will need SFPs in order to use one of these with a fiber optic link. And I was also lucky that one of the studio cameras that I had purchased used did come with an SFP already in it. So I actually have four SFPs from the studio converter, in addition one for this camera, which is more than I need because I only have two of these cameras in the first place. But I may expand that in the future. In case you're wondering, the overhead cameras are Blackmagic Micro Studio cameras, and they don't have any fiber optic capabilities, at least not without a separate converter attached to them, which, you know, this is kind of pointless in the first place, so, like, that would be super pointless for me to buy, but you never know. So I'm going to get back to the story of my purchase of this thing, because, like I said, it did not work, and uh, when I hooked up a fiber optic cable to the studio camera, and then to this, and then to a monitor... I got absolutely no video and the monitor synced at 1080p um, and I forgot what frame rate, which I think was just the default output from this because the camera was set to 2160p at 24 frames per second. So the first thing I did for troubleshooting was try to decide if these SFPs were working. I tried every, all four channels, all of them appeared to be dead. Now, because these are infrared SFPs, um, looking at them isn't going to prove a thing. So I whipped out my trusty... Fujifilm X-T2, which has no ultraviolet or infrared filtering on it, and pointed it at the SFPs and saw nothing. Now, what I figured out later was that, of course, 1130 nanometers is probably too far into the infrared for a regular camera sensor to pick up. So um, if you're trying to debug it with just a regular camera sensor, you're probably going to be out of luck. Like, you know, you can see remote controls using your cell phone camera. Um, this just will not appear on any camera that I tried it with. But it was then that I realized, duh, I have a thermal Im imaging camera, and maybe the thermal imaging camera will detect the range of infrared that this transmits in. And in fact, it does and did. 
Now, pointing it at the back of the unit really doesn't show too much because the whole thing is kind of bright. Now, just simply pointing the thermal imaging camera at the back of the unit doesn't really prove much because you can see both of the holes there are kind of lit up. And that's just because of, well, heat, because the laser emitter generates heat. This entire SFP heats up and therefore it looks hot on both sides. And even if the SFP is somewhat dead, it might still heat up. And so you might still see that. So it was then that I decided to actually plug a fiber optic cable into it and look down the ends of the fiber cable with the camera. If I get it lined up and you'll see at a certain angle, if I get it pointed directly at the camera, you can see a little bit of flashing light coming out of, I mean, it's just flickering because the reticle keeps going over it, but you can see that there's a bit of light right there and it's reading at about 50 degrees Celsius which is, you know, relatively hot, but of course it's not physically hot. It's just emitting a decent amount of infrared light. So I realized the SFPs were at least working and trying to transmit some kind of data, but uh, again, nothing was appearing on, uh, in either direction. And I did test it coming out of the camera and I did test all the SFPs and all the SFPs were in fact transmitting infrared light. So this is where the troubleshooting gets interesting because I discovered something that's probably not documented and you're probably not aware of, and that is that standard 10 gigabit SFPs. And these are the type that are used with, well, one of them came out of an Intel network interface card and the other is compatible with an HP switch. So they're fairly generic 10 gigabit ethernet SFPs, or at least SFPs designed to be used with ethernet devices. Although there's nothing specific in these that say ethernet or that make them ethernet only. So what I did is very adventurously knowing that this you know, not knowing if these SFPs would be compatible at all and thinking this might blow up either the SFPs or any remaining functionality in this unit, I dared to plug one in to here. And these SFPs operate at 850 nanometers, which is actually red. And if I get it lined up with the camera, you can see it lit up red right there because this is transmitting data out of that port. And the other ports used for reception, so obviously you'll see nothing there. But uh, for diagnostic purposes, okay, that's great. Now you can actually see, if you don't have a thermal imaging camera, and but you do have somehow a 10 gigabit SFP, you can plug it in and see if it's actually trying to transmit something. So that's a great first step in debugging this thing. Now one thing about the Blackmagic SFPs operating at, well, 1130 nanometers, is that they need fiber that can transmit that, and th it, they use single mode fiber, and this is single mode OM1, OM2 fiber, and it's actually specified as, as G652 cable. So G652 is what you wanna look for if you're looking for cable for the Blackmagic SFPs. But the 10 gigabit SFPs use OM3 fiber, which is multi-mode, and will of course transmit this wavelength of light successfully. And well, long story short, I did hook, I did plug another one of the 10 gigabit SFPs into the camera, plugged it in, and lo and behold, it worked. You can see those are the lights in front of me. Um, I'm gonna come through in a very out of focus fashion, but you can see this is transmitting using 10 gigabit SFPs over multi-mode fiber, which as far as, well, black magic design is concerned, I don't think is supposed to be possible. And I was very excited. I was like, holy crap, this thing actually does work. And I guess, I somehow just have four or five bad SFPs. Because of course I could have one good SFP, but if it doesn't have a good one to communicate with, you know, I can't test it. So I either had four or five bad SFPs, but at least these cheap generic 10 gigabit SFPs that are used for standard ethernet equipment work. And that's great. Cause like I said, those, those can be found very cheaply, especially knockoffs, which, you know, I would, would not recommend um, if you're running mission critical stuff, well, I just recommend buying Blackmagic SFPs in the first place just to ensure compatibility. But if you're just playing around like I am or you're in a pinch, um, you can use 10 gigabit SFPs apparently. Uh, probably not covered under warranty or anything like that, but hey, what works works. And sometimes what works is what's important. So then I took everything apart. Well, not took everything apart, but disconnected everything and set it aside for a couple days and then decided to make this video about it. And when I plugged it all back in, it didn't work. Absolutely no video, same symptoms as before, even with the 10 gigabit SFP. And I thought, okay, maybe, I, maybe this thing kills SFPs. 
So I took the SFP out of this and out of the camera and tested it, tested them both in Ethernet cards, and they appeared to work just fine. So it didn't kill the SFP, but the box appeared to be completely dead, even though I checked again and even the Blackmagic SFPs were transmitting infrared light. So I thought that was strange. And I was kind of at my wit's end and I decided, well, what about this USB 2.0 port? I mean, it's always good practice when you get equipment of unknown provenance to update the firmware to the latest version because, you know, you want the latest version of firmware, presumably, on your equipment. So I decided to go through the firmware upgrade process, which weirdly worked. It went through to 100% and then got stuck at 100%, but this device reset itself at the end of the upgrade process. And lo and behold, it worked. And it has worked ever since. I've tried turning it off, turning it back on, and testing it uh, probably 20 more times since then just to make sure it was reliably working. Like, it wasn't just a fluke that one time I turned it on and it happened to work, and that's when I had the SFP in it, and then that happened to be right after the former upgrade. But no, it works fine now. So if you get one of these on the used market, I'm hoping that if it doesn't work for you, my story here will help you out just diagnosing the problem, and then maybe maybe fixing it with a firmware upgrade or with replacement SFPs. And just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to hook this up using single mode fiber, using the Black Magic Design SFPs, or one of them anyway. Well, two of them, I guess, one in the camera, one in the studio converter. And you can see that with the yellow single mode fiber attached, and I can assure you I swapped out the SFPs, otherwise this wouldn't work at all. And uh, it's working just fine. You can even see a weird angle of my mug again. And one other thing I also wanted to demonstrate, by the way, one thing I don't like about this design is that they put the SDI out right above the fiber optic connector. So like it can be really hard to get your finger in there to release the fiber optic connector without uh, first unscrewing this or really maneuvering in, especially in the back of a rack when you're coming at it from the back and you can't really get at it from the side. Um, you really have to disconnect the video out in order to access the fiber connection, which is just kind of a pain in the ass, a small design note, not that Blackmagic Design cares about my notes, but you know. But one thing I did want to demonstrate is that you don't actually need to have two fibers running uh, to your camera. You can run a single fiber, you just won't have talkback capabilities, and you won't have the ability to monitor program output or control the camera remotely. But here I have a fiber optic cable where the connectors are split out, so... This should be the input on this side. And you can see I'm only plugging in one of them. And then if I plug that into the optical out on the camera, and there we go again, with just one of the fibers connected, we have a video feed. So if for some reason you only have a single strand of fiber to run, um, you can do it with just a single strand, but you wouldn't have any communication with your camera operator, at least not over the fiber optic link. And if you are running uh, two fibers, that can prove advantageous. Uh, for example, if you lose one of the fibers, if it gets damaged or something, in a pinch, you can swap them around so that you can't talk to your camera operator, but at least you get a video feed from the camera, which, you know, is better than nothing. Oh, and I should point out that this style of fiber optic cable is meant really for building wiring and maybe for patch cables between equipment, uh, you know, in a rack or somewhere it's not going to get damaged because this fiber, although relatively durable, I wouldn't say is suitable for on location or on set use where it could get trampled. It could get caught in a doorway, you know, it could get a door slammed on it, etc. could be run over by a dolly. Who knows? Uh, the point is any one of those things is possible in a real set or location. So you can get armored fiber optic cable, which has both more strands of fiber in it just for redundancy and also a, more durable jacket and some sort of strain relief internally. So now I'd like to take a look inside this thing because frankly I haven't and I would like to know what the uh, circuit board looks like just for just for fun. I mean, I'm not gonna, there's nothing to troubleshoot, there's nothing I'm gonna fix inside. And this probably isn't that user serviceable other than maybe the power supply. Um, that would be another advice, by the way, that I would have. If you do get one of these used and you plug a line voltage power cable into it and it fails to function, like you don't get anything lining up on the front, uh, you don't get any video or anything going on. There's also a fan on the side. If you don't feel air from that fan, that probably means the power supply is dead. That would be my guess anyway in that circumstance. And so in that case, I would recommend taking a 12 volt power supply and hooking it up to this jack to see if it works off of that because that would 
presumably bypass the majority of the switch mode power supply that's undoubtedly in this thing. To find out for sure, we'll have to take a look inside. Oh, by the way, one small tip as I'm cleaning up my bench. If you want to save these caps from your fiber optic cables and save these uh, protective boots from the back of your SFPs, you can just, usually they have holes in them, and so you can just stick them in like that, and this way it's, well, it's still easy to lose this tiny piece, but it's harder to lose these two uh, caps for the fiber optic cable, and this way it kind of keeps it all together. All right, that's 12 screws to take it off, eight on top, two on either side. And here we have the internals. Now, unfortunately, I didn't realize it'd be a daughter board obscuring this board. And the daughter board has the all of the top row of BNC connectors attached to it. So I'd have to unscrew all these BNC connectors, also unscrew the board and figure out how it sockets in. So I don't want to take this apart too much because, well, I don't want to break it or risk uh, you know, damaging anything inside. So we'll take a tour as best we can. So here is, of course, the power supply module, and it is a separate module. It's not part of the main circuit board, which is, of course, good. It's joined to the main circuit board by this cable. So if you had to replace that, you could presumably replace it pretty easily. In fact, it looks like you could take this out without taking anything else out in the chassis. And as I suspected, here are the input wiring at, the, at line voltage, also modular power connector there, which is great. But the 12 volt power connector on the back goes directly onto the main circuit board that takes up the rest of the chassis and kind of swings underneath this daughter board and travels along here. So you can imagine the width of it because all of the bottom row of connectors, including these XLR jacks, appear to be connected to the main board. So it extends all the way up to the power connector internally. So after the power supply, we have this fairly chunky speaker unit, uh, volume control knob, which is modular, attached uh, with a cable that has connectors on both ends. Again, this, this seems very serviceable overall. Uh, the front keypad PCB, which is back here, also has connectors, so it is modular and easy to replace if you can get your hands on them. I don't, I don't know if for, you know, if black magic design sells these replacement parts to end users, they should, but I don't know if they do. We have a couple of more jacks that are also wired with connectors internally for the headset on the front, a exhaust fan, which actually has a very small exhaust port on the side which is then covered by these holes. So yeah, very small channel of air that comes out. And the board is actually labeled this way. And it does appear that there are at least a couple of test points on here. There's a 3.3 volt test point there and a 2.5 volt test point there and a 1.35 volt test point there. So if you needed to test out whether this thing's getting power to the main board, you can test it out from those points presumably. Um, this is actually copyright 2013. I didn't realize it was that old of a design. Uh, that's not necessarily when this unit was built, of course. That was just uh, the design date for probably maybe just this PCB or maybe the entire unit. Definitely quite uh, advanced for 2013, um, being that it supported 4K at 30 FPS. So yeah, if you'd like to take a closer look at it, I'm just going to show it in segments so that you can pause the video. And I apologize for those of you who are hungry to see what's under this daughter board PCB. It honestly doesn't look like there's a heck of a lot. Um, there are a few small chips, which are probably support chips for the SFPs and or XLR connectors. They're, you know, might be, uh, they might be DACs or something. I don't really know. But um, there is one for each channel. And this is probably the main processor. I don't know if it's an FPGA or CPLD or an ASIC but it is uh, something that runs relatively hot because it has a cooling fan. And I'm very grateful to see that this is very clean on the inside. So this hasn't been run in a dusty environment yet. And otherwise looks to be in pretty pristine condition. 
just looking at the capacitors, I don't see any bulging on the power supply. And everything looks to be in good shape. So, and of course, the thing does work, so that's, uh, that's great. And I, again, I do like the fact that it has that 12-volt auxiliary input. So presumably, as long as there's no problem with the voltage regulators on the main board, if the PSU dies, this unit is still usable with a very uh, universal and accessible power adapter. Now, of course, that is labeled backup power, so I would imagine, although I haven't tested this, it could be run with both mains power and that 12 volt DC power hooked up to it. And if either one fails, it should still keep operating. Um, that's what I would hope uh, is the case for this. And I got to imagine it is. I don't see why they'd call it backup power if not. So anyway, that's my story of the Blackmagic Studio Converter 2. Again, it's just weird. It says uh, that on the chassis, it's labeled ATEM Studio Converter 2 even though it's not called the Converter 2, but I'm guessing back when this was made in 2013, they had other things in mind. And maybe there is like a 3G version of this that isn't sold anymore that I don't know about. I suppose I could look it up, but I didn't. And, uh, well, feel free to. Anyway, uh, let me know in the comments uh, what the deal is with that, if you know. So I've been Scott. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you want more details, I sometimes update these videos well, I don't update the videos themselves, but I update the information about these videos or what these pertain to on my website, s.co.tt. And uh, yeah, until next time. Always retest something after taking it apart just to make sure that it works. Um, not that anything should have happened to it, but you never know.